Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. How are you today, Mom? I'm good. It's a beautiful day here, and uh, so I'm enjoying that. It is. It's the uh, the end of summer. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep, the end of summer. <laughs> Looking forward to fall, not winter so quite so much. Right. Well, I don't know. Winter winter comes and goes, you know, but it, there's a lot of a lot of months that are are not winter, so we're good. We're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um do you want to tell our listeners today who we are going to be talking to? Well, today we are going to be talking to uh an author of a very interesting book and a very timely book. And uh, the author is Vanessa Hua, and she is a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and author of a short story collection, Deceit and Other Possibilities. For two decades, she has been writing about Asia and the, I'm not sure I pronounce this, dias, diaspora, I'm not sure what that is, but we'll ask her, in journalism and in fiction. She received the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, the Asian Pacific Award in Literature, and many other things. She, um, her work has appeared in New York Times, The Atlantic, Frontline World, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. And she writes a weekly column for the San Francisco Chronicle, lives in Northern California. Very interesting book, I must say. I'm just. <laughs> and the title it, of this novel is A River of a Stars. A River of Stars, yeah. And I wondered all through, all through the book, I'm going, why is it called that? And the last page, I found out. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. But, <laughs> Welcome but it, to Writer's was. Voices, Vanessa. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Great. So, is this okay. your first novel? Yes, A River of Stars is my debut novel. My other book is a short story collection. And your background is in journalism. Yes. Well, I began writing short stories ever since. I was a kid writing fiction, um, but yeah, my professional career after I graduated from college was in journalism um, before I returned to fiction. Wow. And what made you decide to take that turn? I remember, um, you know, looking at some stories I'd written in college and thinking, these aren't bad, but do I remember how to do that? <laughs> and so much of my identity had been around being a fiction writer. So I returned by um, starting to go to, to, you know, writing groups and writing conferences, um, you know, writing in the morning before work and at lunch. Um, and it, But it wasn't until I was on this journalism reporting trip to South Korea and I was talking to another journalist and I said, oh, you know, I've always wanted to write a, a novel. And she looked at me and said, well, then write one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she was just making conversation, I suppose, but it, it really resonated with me that I needed to make that goal, you know, closer to the center of my life. If, if that was something I, if I was saying that was something I always wanted to, to do, I had to go about doing it and trying to make that happen. So did you quit your your day job did you write on so, the um, weekends yeah the the writing i mean being a, a newspaper journalist is very demanding and all-consuming the sort of thing where you're always getting calls at dinner and working on weekends and vacations getting canceled so for me writing a book was not something i could do on the side um and so i was able to i, I applied to get my master's of fine arts and got into UC Riverside, which has an excellent program. They also are it was fully funded, so I didn't have to pay for any of it. Um, and so it seemed like a great place uh, for, you know, to have the time and guidance in which to work on a, a book-length project. Um, and, you know, not everyone, you know, there's an ongoing debate. People often ask, like, do I need an MFA? And there's certainly there are many different routes to writing and publishing a book. Um, but for me, that was that was the path I took. Well, it sounds like it's it really was for the be, to be able to focus on this that that was a very right. Good although path. Um, although what I worked on in grad school was not this book. That's <laughs> what I worked on in grad school is actually going to be my next book. But 
<laughs> I mean, it's just a long and and winding road um, in terms of you know developing as a writer. Um, you know the you know the collection came out. I you know still was freelancing as a journalist, um, and so and I also in that time um, you know had kids. So many life changes and. So you, you have to sort of manage your writing life around everything else. Well, this book, of course, is, is very, the, the subject matter is very timely and important for all of us to know the, these things, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, uh, we, we hear, you know, you, you hear this and you hear that, but I'm assuming that you're actually uh, writing something that's, that's real and, uh, and pertinent and things we should know. Am I right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think um, right now the country is so divided and often immigrants and the children of immigrants are under attack. And what happens is they're, you know, reduced either to stereotype or statistic. And so we just don't know about individual stories. We're we're not hearing them. And when you take away someone's story, um, you take away their humanity. So in, in my journalism and in my fiction, I've always tried um, to shine a light onto untold stories. And, you know, so we, we might better understand someone's dreams, motivations, um, histories, and, you know, to understand what motivates their actions and, you know, to reflect the world that we live in. Right. Well, you, you mentioned um, in... in uh in your acknowledgement section, uh, a place called Writer's Grotto. Could you tell us about that? Oh, yes. Um, every chance I get, I, I shout it out. Um, uh, you know, it's a, a workspace in San Francisco founded um, a little over two decades ago. And, you know, there's offices and writing carols and, um, you know, people come in to to write, um, and also we teach classes there. And it's just a wonderful community because um, obviously to finish a book, it's solitary. It's only you sitting at your desk with your notebook or at the computer. But the times in which you can find community are really sweet. Um, And, you know, you can commiserate, you can talk through like a narrative dilemma, a publishing dilemma, um, and then when it comes time uh, for a book to come out or a movie to come out or, you know, some other wonderful um, fruit of our labors, then it's a chance to celebrate with this community that, that backs you, that, you know, shows up at your readings. Um, I like to say we roll deep at the San Francisco Writers Grotto. So, um, I, I mean, and I think it's the sort of spirit that you can see happening um, in other writing communities. Um, you know, around the country. And I think, uh, you know, people often ask, like, oh, I wish there was a writer's grotto where I lived. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, start when yourself, you know, make yeah, right. so, yeah, so much about writing community um, is often about sort of like putting yourself out there, you know, putting, doing a podcast, hosting a reading, going to readings. Um, and the more you put yourself out there, I've found um, you get 10 or 100 times back in terms of like, benefit of, 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 of uh, you know, what you put out in the universe comes back to you. Yeah. You know, that's well, actually think- a great idea to, to for people to start them. It, it doesn't take much, really. Right. It's just about, um, you know, well, to, I mean, you know, depending on how you want, want, want to model it, if you, you know, decide that you, it could be something as, for example, there's groups called Women Who Submit. And they just decide, I think, every month or every quarter to meet in a cafe of their choosing. And everyone shows up. And, you know, in that hour, they sort of um, decide, oh, okay, we're, we're going to submit to all those literary magazines or magazines that we put off pitching to. And we're going to do that right now. Oh. So it's a, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the grotto it has a physical space. So, you know, there's kind of more, um, you know, it's a little more complicated in, in terms right. of keeping that going. But right. but the spirit is there. The spirit of community can kind of be kindled and carried on wherever you live. I mean, it could even be online, right? Like oh, you can find that support sure, that way. Sure. You know, Vanessa, you, you used the word um, writing carols. And mm-hmm. I hadn't heard that word in a long time. And for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's like a little desk with 
sides, so they're, the desks are side by side, and, and but they have um, dividers between them. And it just flashed back to um, study carols in, or library carols. And I just have some really, really positive um, connotation with that, and I'm not even sure why. Well, uh, probably like like myself, you might have some very fond memories of studying or being in the library, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so, so what's so wonderful at the, at the grotto is, you know, you get to you get into your carol or go into your office. You put in for me, I'll put in my headphones and I, I get to work. Um, and you kind of look over and you see other people sort of getting to work and you seeing each other sort of like motivating like is extremely um rewarding because it's sort of like okay they're going at it i'm going to go at it um Mm -hmm. and you know and what can feel like sometimes um you know foolish or pointless or like what am i doing (laughs) um you see that other people are engaged also in this practice of art making and that that it does matter and, and and it should matter you're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Vanessa Hua, author of A River of Stars. Now, this book is about an immigrant from China who is sent here by her lover to give birth to their, what they think, supposed son um, in the U.S. so that he will have U.S. citizenship. Is this yeah. something that happens frequently? I mean, it happens. I don't know if it's in huge numbers, but I'll, maybe it will help to explain how I first heard about it and got inspired to write the book. Um, I was, yeah, I was pregnant and living in Southern California at the time. And I began hearing about what um, was termed uh, like maternity hotels or birth tourism hotels. What it is, is, uh, you know, suburban homes, you know, east of Los Angeles, um, pregnant Chinese women were coming and going. The alleyways, the garbage cans were like piled high with diapers and the neighbors were completely baffled. They wondered what is going on. And to me, it sounded like a brothel in reverse <laughs> to have all these pregnant women coming. Um, and it turned out, yeah, there was sort of a underground industry, you know, sort of, in hide, yet also hiding in plain sight, um, where you could go to their website, you could um, book, um, you know, a room, standard, luxury, and, um, you know, sort of accommodating women who were willing to make the trip here. And I think um, what fascinated me or what really moved me was, um, you know, for me, or being pregnant is one of the most vulnerable times in a woman's life. And so what was it, you know, why would they were willing to be far from friends and family? Like, what was it about U.S. citizenship? What did it mean to them for their children um, to, to want to have that for children, their children, so that they would, would come here? And, I mean, since I've written the novel, I've heard that it happens, like, sort of on a de facto basis, like, with people with some means who can come here. I mean, sometimes it's also a matter of um, wanting to access, you know, paying for and accessing the the, you know, higher standards of health care. Um, I heard Russian mothers, you know, do it in Miami. But I'll be clear, it's not huge, like, it's not a, a flood of people, but it, it certainly exists and continues to exist. Let me ask you this. Would would it be harder for uh, a pregnant woman to, to obtain a visa? Because uh, the authorities would think that the reason she was traveling was because she wanted her child to be born in the United States. Right. Well, um, they, I mean, they, they're all coming in on tourist visas. So whatever way that they, you know, the sort of um, requirements that often come in w- that are attached to visas, like having a bank account and, you know, a pledge to return, all that, you know, that's still still all in place. Um, uh-huh. But but yeah, like you from what I read in news reports, you know, women would come and sort of bag your clothes. And, you know, they would maybe, like, take a detour to the Grand Canyon or Vegas before making their way onward um, to, you know, to, to the U.S. So, and I, I don't, they're not necessarily, you know, when, when at the at the visa, the border control, um, they're not telling, like, oh, I'm here to give birth to a baby. They're saying, like, I'm, 
you know, if anything, it's a, it's a lie of omission. Yeah. I see. So okay, they, they no, do no. try and hide it because otherwise they might be suspect. Right, right. But at that, I mean, you're not supposed to be traveling anyway on airplanes after 36 week, right? Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. So let me ask you about the China's, is China's one child policy still in effect? Um, it's been gradually relaxed and I can talk a bit about the history briefly. Um, okay. so it was founded, um, you know, put into place in 1979 to curb um, the birth rate and in the hope of spurring economic development. Um, and it was, you know, enforced in sort of um, a very draconian fashion, like forced abortions, forced sterilizations. Um, and, you know, in my novel, Scarlett is an only child, as many are if, of her generation. And her mother um, works at a family planning clinic because she's a widow and sort of that's the best way she can, you know, take care of, um, her and her daughter, but, you know, Scarlett ends up, after witnessing sort of what her mother has done to be an enforcer, um, it makes her, you know, ambivalent about having kids, makes her, you know, she leaves home as a teenager to find work in the factories because she wants a life different than her mother's. Um, so she's, you know, fully been shaped by that that policy. Um, the, the Chinese government, um said in 2015, um, which is actually after uh, the you know, the events in the novel take place. Anyway, the Chinese government said, um, okay, actually, you can have two children. And now, even more recently, they're trying, there's talk of incentives, like, oh, you know, we really want you to have at least two children. With, <laughs> so bonuses, wow. tax incentives. Um, and, you know, what they found is China already probably would have had a falling birth rate because it was advancing um, economically. This happens to all developing, you know, countries. And um, so, and right now there's sort of a demographic time bomb because there's an elderly population and, a, a, you know, a population, you know, the birth rate is not sort of keeping up pace to help support, you know, the elderly. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll it'll be interesting to see if it kind of, you know, we had a couple decades where China was coercing women to only, or, you know, families to only have one child, and now it's like, are they going to try and coerce the other direction? So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, the other yeah. issue, as I understand it, is um, the other kind of time bomb is that men, young men, far outnumber young women. Right, right. Um, either the women, you know, don't, they were either aborted or um, or uh, some of them, and this is how sort of how this policy touches U.S. shores. Like they, you know, baby Chinese baby girls were put up abroad for adoption. So um, because of the the culture's traditional preference for boys, coupled with the one child policy, that led to these unforeseen consequences. How serious yeah. do you think that is? That imbalance. Well, I mean, the Chinese government is. Uh, trying to rectify it. And I mean, there are, um, there have been, I don't know, like some, and again, I don't know if this, this isn't widespread, but it like has certainly happened where maybe there might be, you know, kidnap brides or, you know, wow. Chinese men might marry women from other neighboring countries. Um, but of course there's like a whole cultural <laughs> language barrier. Um, and so it'll, I mean, we'll just have to see what happens. Like, in some ways, China um, is, like, so advanced. Like, the skyscrapers are, like, hot, like, so tall, and the, the subway system is, like, a dream. Um, but in other ways, there's, like, still um, a deep, you know, poverty. You, you exit this, you leave the city and drive for an hour, and people are still farming by hand. Like, they don't even have an ox. So, um, you know, it, China's resources are... Um, you know, part of China's strength is its vast numbers, but that's also what China has to sort of figure out how to, to manage, like this, this, this huge population and, you know, how do you address the, the inequalities and, and then go from there. Mm. I was wondering, I was wondering about the use of, of surrogates for, for people to use too, you know, if they, um, I don't know, that, that gets into a whole other thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, there were, when the one child policy was in effect, I think, 
Um, there were some cases of people going abroad, for example, to get IVF so that they could come back with two babies, you know, or, or give birth and have two babies. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, as with, you know, I think, you know, all eyes are on China, just as, you know, all eyes are on the U.S. in terms of, like, what the future will hold. Mm-hmm. So, Vanessa, That's you right. write a lot about immigrant issues as a journalist, and also, um, you know, your book is, you know, that's sort of what it's the basis of it. Um were you are you from an immigrant family yourself? Yeah, I'm the American-born daughter of Chinese immigrants. My parents came to this country in the 1960s to attend grad school. Um my mom's a scientist, my dad was an engineer, and so I've always been um interested in trying to understand, you know, what it means to leave your country, your culture, your language and to try and forge a new life you know, and be a stranger in a strange land. And, um, but I mean, I think, um, people who are, say, not as recently immigrated still, um, resonate, uh, find the book resonates with them because it, you know, like any, like being an outsider, motherhood, um, you know, trying to make your way in the world, those are universal, right? Whether you're an immigrant or not. And I think it's, um, you know, when you show the sort of humanity of of people's stories, um, you know, whether in journalism or in fiction, that's, you know, that's how you can sort of make a connection with the reader. How do you think it has changed for immigrants from China today, like your character Scarlett Chen, versus when your parents came over? Is it very similar or, or is it different? Um, I mean, it it's, uh, it's certainly there's greater numbers because my parents actually arrived, you know, as in a special category as foreign students, you know, on fellowships issued by the university, um, you know, and it was before the 1965 Immigration Act, which totally reshaped um, immigration in this country. So, um, you know, there were there weren't so you know, so many, there wasn't as much Chinese immigration in, um, like when my parents first arrived. And now, um, because the Immigration Act allows for things like, um, sponsorship of family and family reunification, um, that has led to, you know, not just China, you know, my parents never lived in Chinatown, but, you know, th- there's some, you know, I, I grew up in the suburbs. There's many more Chinese living, you know, everywhere, not just not just in sort of one neighborhood. And, um, I mean, certainly there, there were, uh, you know, China, my parents came from Taiwan, which had relations with the U.S., whereas China itself was closed until sort of Nixon, um, you know, ping pong diplomacy and all that. So sort of like both the numbers and sort of where, where people are coming from and what, you know, it, it, before there were many more Cantonese speakers and now there's many more Mandarin speakers. Um, so, so it's, it's just, um, I think what, what, what we really are seeing is how, um, the Chinese community is not a monolith and that we have these very diverse histories, um, occupations, um, you know, and, and I think, I hope that's reflected in a river of stars. You know, we have both, um, you know, feisty entrepreneurs and, you know, scoundrels that actually, you know, have a heart of gold kind of thing going on. Mm. Yeah. Well, so there's definitely some interesting characters. And, um, but uh, this this one, uh, Mama Fang, is that her name? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. She, 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 uh, she goes from one thing to another. She She's unstoppable. <laughs> one thing fa- and what one thing fails, she just gets into another one, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, and and she's kind of inspired by a couple of things. Um, is in classic Chinese literature, um, you know, the sort of books where there's bandits and heroes and you wrestle with tigers. Often there's um, an elderly woman who's a matchmaker who sort of brokers deals, like whether they're marriages or affairs, and she always, you know, knows how to take a cut for herself. And <laughs> So, you know, there's sort of a wiliness that I, you know, kind of couldn't help but admire. Um, and yet, in some ways, there's sort of like modern analogs where, for example, there was a woman in China 
who realized that all the cardboard packaging in the U.S. that sort of like off of our Amazon delivery was actually very good quality. So she had it sort of shipped back to, to China and reused and recycled. And, you know, she saw treasure where there was trash and, you know, became wealthy as, as a result of being able to see possibility where others could not. And sort of that's sort of embodied in the Mama Fang character. Mm. Well, she, she is an interesting, interesting character for sure. And, um, of course, uh, Scarlet and Daisy. Daisy is another one that's very interesting. And, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, she's, um, I mean, I thought a lot about, so Daisy is um, a pregnant teenager, and what's sort of, you know, in her character, I was able to explore a lot of different um, issues that I found interesting. She was, she herself was born in the U.S. back when her parents were grad students, but then she grew up in Taiwan, but yet she went to an American school. Um, so she, you know, has perfect English and, you know, she's familiar with all the references, you know, having grown up in this oasis of American culture in another country. And I was just really interested in exploring those notions of identity and citizenship and, you know, you know, and also, um, she, I think she and Scarlett may seem different at first. Scarlett's from the countryside, a very, from a very poor family. Daisy's, um, from, you know, some, some privilege. And yet I think they find, um, a kinship both in their, you know, motherhood because they both give birth within weeks of each other and because they, you know, in all that misery and exhaustion of early childhood, they kind of help each other through it. And I think it's sort of like, living through a war or a natural disaster together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you can survive early motherhood um, yeah. with, with someone else, you're going to make a friend for life. So Well, they are they also survivors of their environment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the whole thing. I mean, they really and, – and they uh, – oh, I don't know. They kind of bounce off one another. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know Scarlett gets upset with Daisy because of Daisy's outspokenness, but then she realizes, yeah, that's probably okay. And, you know, it just goes back and forth, so – but this book is one that you, well, you can't put it down. Oh, okay. You want to find out what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And it gets off to a, a fast start. And, yeah. um, it's very, it's very intriguing. It is. It is. Now, Vanessa, did you have to do a lot of research for this book? Uh, well, I think it draws upon my two decades um, as a reporter covering Asian Americans and also going to Asia. I've reported from China and sort of looked at the connections back and forth. But I also, um, you know, have been back to China on reporting trips. So I've, I've had a sense of, you know, what the life for these factory girls is like. Um, and then I also, you know, I read news reports about these maternity centers. I went to their websites. I also looked at some court documents. Um, but what, what I believe is fiction flourishes where the official record ends. So, you know, when the women in, in these situations, when they were reported upon in the media, they obviously weren't talking. <laughs> and so um, I felt it was up to me as a, as, a, as a fiction writer to be able to sort of like imagine what, what it, you know, what brought them here and what it meant for them. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you too about the about the genius or the genius centers. Oh, the little genius, right? <laughs> little genius. I I just that is that are the, are the is that for real? They really do. That? Uh, I I mean I think I was striving for something that often with that or other places in the book like to to have to cut, sort of ride that line like could it be real? Um, well, so that was inspired by a couple things. Um, so. In the, there have been times in Asia where I've been ill, like I had the flu, and then they sort of, um, you know, offered, uh, like an, like a friend had, um, the flu, but then like suddenly they were putting an IV in her. There was like sort of a, uh, I think in some situations a greater willingness to like, and get hooked up to an IV, um, or to use that as a treatment. Um, and then I began hearing that it's actually sort of in vogue among like Hollywood types. Like if, if you're in Las Vegas, you can, if you're feeling hungover, you can get um, hooked up to an IV with vitamins and get hydrated that way. Um, uh-huh. So you sort of have that. Um, and then I did see a photo of um, in China um, of some, some kids or some teenagers allegedly studying for the most important test 
in the country, the, their college entrance exams. And it was this strange photo of all these teenagers hooked up to IV lines. Oh, my. And so sort of um, with all that, I thought, okay, this sort of inspired um, this idea for these little genius centers in the U.S. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just sort of inspired by, but it's not, I mean, as far as I know, uh, you know, they don't actually exist, but who knows, perhaps. But they, but they might so, soon. <laughs> right, exactly. But there, that is always really interesting when you're a fiction writer, something that you've imagined you later find out is coming true. It's almost like you <laughs> predicted the future. Well, I, I, I don't know. I had, I, I must have read another book somewhere where the, the parents were very just, you know, their children were just told, you know, you have to succeed and, and push to really to do that. And, uh, well, that, that's definitely a stereotype. We have, uh, you know, the tiger mom, tiger moms. Right. Do you feel that, you know, is that a valid? Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist and writer. I'm not an engineer or doctor. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> at, you know, as to the preference for boys traditionally in the culture, in my family, my father has, like always supported me and my ambition. So it, I mean, I think that's something I try to show that like there may be this perception, you know, it applies to some, but not all. And sort of like, um, it, it's something that, that, that can definitely be explored more deeply in a, in a book length work. It's interesting that, you know, it's a generalization, a prejudice almost, but it's pos has a positive connotation, but it can still be damaging. Right, especially since if it masks sort of the varying levels of poverty and opportunity available even within the Chinese community. So, you know, depending on your circumstances, it, it can be, you know, you, your your outcomes are very different. And, and, the, and yet to claim like, oh, they're all doing great can be harmful to those who are struggling. I just saw a report that um, Asian Americans, as a demographic, have the widest income disparity of any of any um, demographic group um, in the U.S. Now, yeah, well, that's it represents not just Chinese. That's all right. all Asian, but right, it represents yeah a huge range of ethnicities, cultures. Right, you know, it depends on if you came in as a refugee or an immigrant or you know just. You know, if you were fleeing or coming here for opportunity, <laughs> so so it is it is hard to generalize. But um, you know, in other ways, it's 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 very interesting. Like um, Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in the U.S., and it, it'll be interesting to kind of see what the you know what the future holds in terms of representation, whether in books or in movies. Of course, Crazy Rich Asians just came out was the number one hit movie. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what, what, um, what it opens the way for in the future. Well, this, my, this... my granddaughter is Asian American and my grandchildren, their mothers, uh, was born in Taiwan mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. she, at five years old, she's really interested in numbers. She, when she asked me what, uh, the largest number was. I said I didn't know, but I knew that Google was pretty large. And then she wanted to, she wanted to actually see that number written out. <laughs> right. Oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah. One of my twins, um, he, one of my twins loves storytelling. He loves doing things with little, you know, mini figs or dolls, or like asking what their name is and like doing play acting. Um, and my other son, he loves. He, he loves math. He loves multiplication even more than addition because you get bigger numbers with multiplication. <laughs> yeah. How, and how old are they? Uh, they just turned seven, and oh. they they just started the, the second grade. Oh. That's such a such a wonderful age. Yes, and yeah, they're right still uh, they're still cute and cuddly, but um, but yet you can have real conversations with them. <laughs> exactly, I know my my grandson just will be nine in a couple of months, and I on this last time I saw him, I noticed that when he's walking, that he he's not walking like a little kid anymore. He's got a little bit of a young man kind of swagger going on oh. <laughs> but he can still be cute and cuddly <laughs> yeah but yeah my, i think my my time. heart will my heart will crack open when they completely stop wanting to hold my hand yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
So, Vanessa, would you like to read from A River of Stars? Sure, I'd love to. I'll, um, I'll read an excerpt taken um, from Chapter 1. Great. A River of Stars, Chapter 1. When Boss Jung first told her about Perfume Bay, she'd toss the brochure onto the dashboard and reach for a slice of dried mango. Shaking his head, he took the bag, but before he could stop her, she snatched a slice of chewy sweetness. During her pregnancy, he'd begun scrutinizing her, prescribing advice, some backed by science, but most by superstition, to protect the baby. She shouldn't eat mangoes, as their heat would give the baby bad skin. No watermelon, whose chill would cool her womb. No bananas, which would cause the baby to slip out early. No water chestnuts, mung beans, or bean sprouts, either. The list of traditional prohibitions grew each time she attempted to eat. As he drifted into the next lane, she told him to keep his eyes on the road. He gripped the steering wheel and told her his plan. He wanted to send her and their unborn child halfway around the world to Perfume Bay, five-star accommodations located outside of Los Angeles. After she delivered, staff would file for a Social Security card, birth certificate, and passport for the baby. Their son, his sex recently confirmed, would give them a foothold in America, he said. Eventually, he could sponsor a green card, Scarlett had said. For now, you'll get rid of me. Clever clan, Boss Jung. At the factory, she called him Boss Jung, and she kept it up in private, too, a reminder that she was a deputy manager and not a Xiao Jie, a mistress, a gold digger from a disco or a hostess bar. They passed factories covered in grimy white tile, built on land that had been fields when she arrived here as a teenager. People from around the country had moved to the Pearl River Delta, just across the border from Hong Kong, to make their fortunes, and the factory girl you snubbed might someday become your manager. Boss Young reached into the glove box for a brand new U.S. atlas that he must have hand-carried from Hong Kong. Hope unfurled in her chest. She always navigated on their weekend drives, and with this gift, she pictured them traveling across America together. Whatever hospital you deliver in would be top class, he said. The hospitals are good in Hong Kong, too, she said. Ba Xiong frowned. Hong Kong was also home to his wife and three daughters. It doesn't matter how good the hospitals are in America if I end up in jail, she said. On the radio, a newscaster announced that the U.S. Embassy was evacuating American tourists from Egypt. Ba Xiong stabbed his finger at the radio dial. The U.S. would save our son, he said. From Egypt? Why would I, why would he go to Egypt, she said. From anywhere, he said. The U.S. would get him out of trouble anywhere. That was when Scarlett had realized just how much his son meant to Bas Young, reviving the dream that had died with the birth of his daughters, an heir to carry on his legacy. He had never shared this dream with her, for a boy in his image, a prince of the family. He was almost 60, she was 36. If Scarlett carried a girl, would Bas Young have sent her to Perfume Bay? No. He'd waited to book her a stay until he knew she was having a boy, but objecting to such a preference would have been like objecting to gravity. He sped up, picking off tractor trailers and buses, which still gave her a thrill. Faster and faster they went, getting so far ahead it seemed they might have a, the road's end to themselves. With him behind the wheel, she might go anywhere. He put his hand on top of hers, lacing their fingers together, and she tucked her head against his shoulder. She'd never felt more complete than when nestled against him. If she didn't have this baby, she might never, not with Bas Jung or with anyone else. On her own, Scarlett could have expected deference and attention. One pregnant woman gets a seat on the bus, the front of the line at the bathroom, and good wishes from strangers who pat your bump, ask how far along you are, and guess if you're carrying a boy or a girl. At the sight of a fertile belly, the most hardened can't help but hope for the future, can't help but long for their past. A dozen pregnant women is a different matter. You quarrel over who gets the most comfortable seat at dinner, who eats the last of the tofu stew, and whose aches are the most deserving of sympathy. Now, deep in her eighth month of pregnancy, she'd thought the other guests at Perfume Bay would lose interest, but they wouldn't stop picking on her. On television, the Hollywood sign appeared, iconic letters that stood a few kilometers away, yet seemed distant as the moon. After Scarlett turned up the volume, Lady Yu grabbed the remote and switched the channel. Because Scarlett had never bragged about Boss Young's position, because she never mentioned him at all, the other guests found her suspect. She was a threat, not because she'd go after their husbands, but because she represented any woman, every woman who would. 
it didn't matter that her lover was a stranger to them. Mistresses weren't supposed to have children who competed with theirs. Lady Yu had made it clear she considered Scarlet and the baby she carried Lowly's turtle eggs. Nothing was more despicable than a turtle dragging itself to the muck except their spawn. Lady Yu led the Shanghai clique of spoiled wives who were perhaps only a generation or two removed from the countryside. In Scarlet, they despised who they might have been. Scarlet changed the channel back. Mao Wenhua, no Ming, Lady Yu shouted. Low class, a peasant. She hurled a magazine at Scarlet, missing wildly and hitting the television. Tu Hao, Scarlet said, an insult for the newly rich with more money than manners. Lady Yu heaved herself up and slapped Scarlet. Scarlet rocked back in disbelief, putting up her hands to protect the baby. Lady Yu smiled smugly. Scarlet grabbed a pillow and smacked it against Lady Yu's head. When Lady Yu clawed at her, Scarlet grabbed her wrist and forced her arms down, twisting almost hard enough to sprain. Their screams set off one baby, then all ten babies in the nursery uh, next door, howls that picked up with the speed and power of a tsunami. The owner, Mama Fang, rushed in, trailed by nurses to separate the mothers-to-be, clucking that they shouldn't exert themselves. They should consider their babies and send them to their room. At Perfume Bay, the mothers were treated like children, said that their children would obtain the most precious gift of all, American citizenship. And that was Vanessa Wall reading from A River of Stars. Vanessa, Scarlet. Oh, go ahead. Scarlet uh, faces quite a bit of uh, of uh, abuse in that home because they figure she's not uh, that she's not of the uh, class that they are. The other the other women, is that right? Right, right. They she's surrounded by sort of the pampered wives, um, and you know they're they're suspicious of her. You know they speak a different, um, sort of like their native dialect is different and um, just she's viewed with much suspicion. And so she feels like a, a virtual prisoner um, when, when she's there. And this is sort of sort of building toward why um, she feels like she does need to, to make an escape. And it yeah. wasn't really her choice to be there in the first place. Right. As, um, as in the passage I read, her, her lover, you know, convinced her to do it um and it's only after another sonogram reveals something and only after um her her lover betrays her that she realizes she has to, to take off um mm -hmm. and with a pregnant uh teenage stoa daisy in tow and i've been telling people that it's a, a pregnant selma and louise tale <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right that's yes. right <laughs> perfect now, yeah. when you started writing this, you knew you were going to write about these maternity centers, maternity hotels, but did you know the rest of the story, or how did that unfold for you? Yeah, with, with my fiction, often it um, begins with a premise or a circumstance or situation, and I try and figure out what kind of person would find themselves in this situation, you know, how did they get there and how are they going to get out of it? And so um, once I had heard about the maternity centers and there was one particular news story where a neighbor said that a woman, a pregnant Chinese woman showed up on his doorstep and said she was hungry. And so he took her to McDonald's, he got her a burger and then she, you know, took her right back to the maternity hotel. Um, and, you know, I think, she probably didn't get to eat what she wanted, you know, had no real freedom. And it kind of made me realize, like, what, you know, what would it be like? And, you know, for a dramatic effect, like what, um, you know, it, it can't be just someone who's like sort of unhappy about the, the cuisine, but it has to be someone who feels like things are at stake, like, you know, being with your child and, you know, reproductive freedom and all that. And so that's how the character of, of Scarlett began to develop. And then, at first, Daisy was just um, you know a fun, feisty minor character in one of the scenes um, when it was a, um, a short story, and it sort of ended with Scarlet taking off. But as you know, I couldn't sort of let that short story go, and it sort of felt like it was still expanding in my imagination. And that's when Daisy returned, and and then um, and then I the novel became not just about motherhood, but about female friendship and. Um, sort of what develops between Scarlet and Daisy. And it's, um, I mean, I think that's sort of the, the fun um, and challenge of fiction, that you start with a blank page that feels big as the world <laughs> in terms of all the possibilities, 
Um, but then as you go along and get to know your character and you sort of see what you've laid down in this world, um, you know, you begin to see where they, they have to go and that you are, you, you always hope for that sweet spot of like, you know, being that feeling of surprise, but an inev- inevitability that like, this is what you've been building towards. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the Asian American, the Asian American culture in, uh, in, uh, particularly in San Francisco, was interesting, I thought, because they're not all pulling in the same direction. <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, you know, <clears throat> but uh, it, was, um, it, was, it was really interesting to see how she survived and, you know, flourished in that, in that culture. It was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, Scarlett um, because, becomes an entrepreneur, as, you know, some immigrants choose to do so because they sort of, like, can't work sort of – like formerly like in an, an office or, you know, like what, what kind of jobs in general open to new mothers. Um, but, but for something where she could set her own hours and sort of like determine her own way. Um, and I mean, San Francisco's Chinatown is just such a remarkable place. Um, it's, you know, got this long history. It's the oldest Chinatown in the U S. Um, and yet you go and visit and there's a, a, a throbbing sense of vitality because of the newcomers who continue to, um, arrive in the neighborhood, which serves as a landing pad, a jumping off point into their life here. Um, and yet it also, uh, Chinatown draws a lot of visitors, you know, with their cameras out, going to the shops, going to the restaurants. But that's, so most people, you know, most people's public view of Chinatown is on the ground floor, right? Street level. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But if you look up, you look on the second floor, the third floor, fourth floor, you see clothes hanging um, to dry in the window, laundry, and then you realize, oh, people live here. This is a living, breathing neighborhood, um, and, you know, with very interesting, you know, people have very interesting stories to tell, and, um, it's, you know, as a journalist, I had an opportunity to kind of go visit into that world upstairs, and I wanted to, you know, capture that in my book. When Vanessa, or excuse me, <clears throat> when um, Scarlett and Daisy first got to Chinatown, they weren't welcomed very warmly. Right. They had to figure out the rules of, mm-hmm. and, and customs and, like, who sort of the people, who might be their guide, who to be wary of, um, you know. And so, like, like any place, there's, there's, there's bound to be, to be conflict. And it's sort of, um, it's like about, yeah, even within, you might say, like, oh, you're, you're, like, just go to Chinatown. Like, it's sort of like, there's, you still have to, you know, find your own way since, because the community is not all alike, you know, not all speaking the same dialect, not all from the same place. And so, um, it's about, you know, trying to negotiate your way, way, way there. Now, how do you feel when you go there? Well, I know, I, I mean, I'm not a Chinatown native. I, I grew up in the suburbs, but right. yet I feel enormous sense of familiarity and comfort in some ways, even, um, you know, even stepping into a store and sort of like seeing the candies I ate as a kid or just like that, you know, familiar pungent smell of like dried fish. It just feels like it really hits the olfactory memories. Um, and I mean, I feel, um, just sort of inspired by people who are just trying to, you know, make a better life for their children or for themselves. And you can really sense that when you're, when you're there. So you, you feel at home. And you feel, or I feel, uh, feel it, it feels a sense there. of familiarity and comfort. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, the culture in Chinatown and San Francisco is probably different than the culture of a country that a new immigrant would be coming from too. Exactly, exactly, because, um, for example, I, I remember interviewing people in Chinatown, and, you know, these apartment buildings are often communal kitchen um, or shared bathrooms, like cramped, um, whole families living in these cramped spaces. And one of the women I talked to said that her place in China was actually nicer and newer than when she lived in, in Chinatown. So, um but yet at the same time, the possibilities for education and work were, were better here. So they were willing to live in those conditions um, because of, you know, the flip side of, of what the U.S. offered. So 
do you think that the the new immigrants have a realistic expectation of America? I mean, China is so. I think the the traditional name for um, like sort of a like a older name for China for for San Francisco is Gold Mountain um, because you know Chinese because of the Chinese immigrants who came um, you know during the gold rush. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was seen as Golden Mountain, like a place of limitless opportunity. Um, but of course, in that time, like China itself has developed. So even a peasant will have a cell phone, probably even more advanced than the cell phones we might have, right? In some ways. And so they're not, they're not like naive. There's, you know, they, they see this, you know, they may have seen the skyscrapers or the Ferraris being driven by Chinese millionaires. So they know that such wealth, um, like it's possible even in China. And so, I mean, as, I mean, I can't speak for all Chinese immigrants, but I think, you know, often whether they're Chinese or not, people from other countries are fearful of things like gun violence in this country or just, you know, things that are different or, you know, and in all the ways that we might stereotype in another country, Americans are sort of stereotyped from abroad too. So it's sort of, I think, Um, as a new immigrant, you're really trying to sort of like reconcile what you've heard about the country and what you're actually experiencing and and, and living. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was in Canada last summer and and, um, mentioned that I live part-time in Texas and was greeted with like, oh, isn't it really scary there with all the guns? Right. (laughs) (laughs) Which... It is a little, but but you don't see the guns very often. <laughs> right, right. So it all it all like China's a vast country, the U.S. is a vast country, and it's all about trying to sort of get past the sort of surface um, assumptions that people might make. Right, right. So Vanessa, yeah. when you um, how long did you spend writing this book? Well, let's see. So um, I was inspired when I was pregnant, but the sort of first draft I finished of the short story um, was about nine months after I gave birth, which I thought was kind of a cool symmetry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I certainly was writing other things or attempting to write other things in that, you know, in those months as well. And so so I started the short story and then... um, Again, was working on uh, like another novel, other projects. Um, but I started. So we'll let me put it this way: I started writing um, the sort of seed of it in 2012, and it sold in 2016. And then there was, you know, I went through additional edits with my editor. And so, um, you know, it's hard to say if I compressed the time how how long it would have been because just like sort of. My life is not sort of like a neat uh, trajectory of the book is not like sort of neatly cut through my life because my life sort of pushed back on it. Um, now, was, it yeah. was it easier to get this novel published because you had published the short stories previously? Oh, um, no, actually, they <laughs> they it, it all kind of happened around the same time. I found out I had won this contest um that that led to my short story collection being published and like a couple it was around that time that you know I finished edits with my agent and it was sent out so like I think I announced the pub I I remember going on social media and like announcing my excitement at you know having my short story collection coming out um but then like a week later saying like hey do you remember how (laughs) <laughs> I just announced the short story collection. Well, now I have, uh, you know, a two book novel deal and people are like, Oh, how did you, wow. you know, do that overnight? How did you get three books so quickly? I'm like, by working on my writing for like more than a decade, <laughs> you know, no, no success is, is truly overnight. Well, maybe for some people, but not for me. So, <laughs> so a lot of times you hear that finding an agent is really the hard part. Did you, was that true for you? Um, I was, I feel fortunate. I was able, you know, I'm actually now, I, I switched agents um, over over time. And each time I was, um, you know, able to sort of uh, pick among some. But, you know, it's still hard. There were, you know, as, like, there were as many agents who probably sort of pass on the project as, you know, those who, who wanted to take it on, you know. And, and right. I mean, 
I think the same goes for true is like when you put a manuscript out, even the most popular book out there probably was rejected by one editor or another um, in its journey. And I think it, because of all the sort of the long, long process it takes to put a, a book out, um, it, they, your agent or your editor really has to feel like they fell in love with the book. And so, and so in some ways there's like no rhyme or reason, like you could maybe guess like, Oh, this person might have an affinity for my book, but like, you know, how, can you really say how you fell in love with your partner? Like, is it like a neat set of traits, you know, a checkbox? Or is there something sort of – there has to be chemistry between you, you know, your book and whoever, you know, chooses to take it on. So when you say you, you got a two-book deal, so that was for this book and the one that you worked on in your master's program. Exactly. And yeah. why yeah. was the decision made to bring this one out first? Oh, this one is – was done first. Ah, so my, okay. my master's, I mean, I have a draft of the book that I wrote in grad school, but it, it's the one that I wrote, you know, it's, it's, it's like historic. It's, it's just, you know, you're better now. It's just a different challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and I'm a different writer. I think yeah, yeah. even um, from the start of one, you start writing the book, you're one kind you're one writer and by the end of it, you're another. And so um, I, you know, not that it becomes any easier. <laughs> but hopefully you're but, getting better all the time. Yeah. 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 So, well, Vanessa, it was really a pleasure talking to you today, and we are out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Um, no but it was such a pleasure to – yeah. Oh, go on. I, there's one thing I, I wanted to bring up about the, 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 the journey that, that – uh, and Scarlett had to try to get try to get her green card, and that's what so many immigrants are struggling in the United States to do. And I, you know, so this book really clearly shows what happens and how difficult it is. I think that's so important. That, exactly. That's why, the, that's why this book. That's why this book is really, really important. And it's it's um, you know, <laughs> I, that's why I enjoyed it so much because I I had often wondered about that, and uh, so this really lays it out and shows exactly what happens. Oh, great. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you found it both entertaining but also educational in some way, too. Yes. Yes, indeed. And I think it's so. important to tell these stories. Oh, it is. Absolutely. To be able to see people who maybe look different from me or you, Mom, but to see when you know their stories, then you know their humanity. Right. You can see their right. humanity. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for yes. being with us. And mom, thank you, do you and thank have... you for writing and thank <laughs> you for writing this book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And do you have some closing words for us, mom? Yes, you know, you know who I, I hope everyone knows who Mahatma Gandhi was. A very, very wise man who once said, "We must be the change we want to see in the world." So it's up to us to change these things. Thank you, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Bye-bye.